That sounds good. So, thank you very much for the introduction and, and thank you also for the, the invitation, especially to Anita for um, making this possible. Um, give me some, some breaking now. Yeah. Yeah. So, my name is Jörn Kohlhammer and I'm from Fraunhofer IGD from Darmstadt. I was one of the guys who said Darmstadt. Um, and I'm definitely one, one of the guys who said data visualization is my main interest since that is uh, what we actually, what I'm working in since uh, 15 years or even 20 years at, at Fraunhofer in, in Germany and in the US. So we, we think the entire day about how to make data more visible, how to, how to help people understand lots of data and how to well, how to access the data in a, <coughs> in a more, well, visual way. And that's why um, the title of the, of the talk, we have an open data, we have some open data use cases that we talked about with UMEDSAT, with SAS, how can we, how can we um, maybe make UMEDSAT data visually accessible. And the visual analytics approach, and hopefully th this is a takeaway message um, today for you, is how do I visually access data? How can I analyze data in a visual way? Okay, so first some advertisement for visualization. Also, 40% of you don't need that. Um, visualization is really underexploited at the moment from our perspective. So we can do a lot with data visualization with our channel between the screen and our eyes, the human vision. Um, that is not exploited at the moment. We have a really high bandwidth to take in data through visualization. And the other big thing is interaction and the interactive concepts make it really easy for, for humans to interact with this, yeah, what we sometimes call human data interface. So how can we, how can we take in data quickly? How can we make the system know what we as user actually want to have from it? I'm trying to find a good position here so that I don't stand in the way you of my slides. Right? Over there. Okay. That should work. So in in one in one sentence, visualization is really this simply the fastest way to, to communicate data to humans. So let me give you an example. Of course we could read text as usually one of the, the things that we could use in, in addition or in, we could read all this, A is connected to B, B is connected to C. You might start to build a picture, an image of what this graph might look like, but when I show you the graph, of course, it's much faster. This is, um, this is really, this goes down to the, to the simple, um, the, the, the simple truth that if I have two dots and I have a line between it, perceiving that line and the two dots is much faster than reading the sentence, this dot and this dot is connected. And we can exploit this with graphs, we can exploit this with all kinds of visual, visual elements to make the data brain connection a lot faster. Of course, this is not new in a sense for you, Many for, for many of you not, but even for the entire world. I mean, visualization has been used for many, many years. So Minar, for example, um, created this, this non-interactive information design of Napoleon's campaign starting in Paris back in 1812, going towards Moscow and turning back. That's the black line here and coming back to Paris. And you can see the, the size of this, yeah, kind of like a, a moving bar chart, is the, the, his troops. So the number of his troops diminishing until he reaches Moscow and then they, they are hit by, here you see a temperature line, in addition they are hit by a really strong winter, decimating to maybe a, a small fraction of what was actually starting out when they, when they started in Paris. So of course this is a simple non-interactive graph, but Anyway, this, um, there's a lot of data in there. 
And um, you know, of course, thought about this uh, a lot. Um, how can I can I show all these uh, different information bits in one one screen? Um, and it's not in the interactive. So you cannot say, okay, uh, can I can I get more information about what happened in Moscow or something? Of course, today when we say visualization, then and today, today we have all kinds of possibilities with with today's tools to access data. And here's an example, of course, when we're here in Heidelberg, an example from SAS where we can um, create visualizations with a mouse click and then see and then try out different visualizations. How, how does it, how do I see the data when I use a scatter plot or if I use a ring chart? Um, I might even want to visualize things on my mobile, but I still, I'm always in the, in the, have the possibility to interact with things. So it's as easy as, it's, it's easier than ever before. But still, there's, there's a certain, well, something that holds up visualization to be used everywhere, or good visualization to be used everywhere. And maybe we can, we can get to um, a visual analytics approach to, to approach data in the, in the future. So what, what happens usually? So usually, we first have, we don't start with data. We start with a user, and this user has a certain task. So I have an idea, for example, maybe we heard about uh, this example, maybe I have a, the idea of to better understand what, what the pollution really is in Frankfurt. I, I want to use more sensors and I want to show this. There's my task and my, my question is really, okay, what kind of data can I, can I use for this? But if I find this data, um, I, I have to select the right data that supports my task. And raw data comes, usually comes in well, sometimes in a not so accessible form, of course. If we talk about <coughs> um, well, sensor data, of course, it's probably at least digital. If you look at medical uh, cases these days, um, well, the medical data that clinics have is usually exactly that. Maybe not as nicely organized. <laughs> and so getting to this data is really but if you look at, at data, if we talk about, okay, can, can we find data? That's not the problem, right? We have, we have lots of data. We can find data. And open data, that's what we talk about today, is, is around um, everywhere. And there are some very interesting uh, data sources. For example, GDELT has news sources from around the world um, in 100 languages to, to learn about people, locations. Uh, you, can, you can look and search for I don't know, topics that developed around the world. You can see in which countries was a certain topic quite uh, prominently um, identified. And this is open data. So you can just, maybe you have an idea, some hypothesis that you can try out by accessing this news source. Another example is, is Gapminder, also very visual with a nice, with a nice interface already. Um, they have the UN health data and World Bank data where you can, if you are interested in, in countries, how the world develops um, with, uh, on, on the health side or on economics, um, it's very easy to, to show yeah, time-related data about countries in the world. And since we're talking about TED also, you, you probably know the, the really nice TED talk by Hans Rosling explaining how this, how this tool works, which is a, a bubble chart, but he, he it's more like a, a football game when Hans Rosling presents this. He, he, he died very recently, um, at the beginning of the year. So here we have other data. And of course, something we want to talk about more today is the UMEDSAT data, satellite data, um, which is, am I doing anything wrong? No. <laughs> very close to the speaker. So you're very close to the speaker. Ah, I see. Sorry. UMEDSAT data. Um, it's satellite data in all kinds of forms. There are different satellites that, that come with different sensors um, that you can exploit for different use cases. So you, whether you want to know how much sunshine there was in the last 10 years or in, in Europe or to distinguish between different areas um, on, on a map to automatically find out what is water, what is sand, what, is what are the trees and then 
use the data from the last 10 years to, to show some kind of yeah, development if you're interested in, in climate data, for example. So we come back to, to the human side data later. Thankfully, with most of the open data sources, you don't have to go through piles of paper and try to digitize that. Or they, they usually come in, in, in the form of data tables where you, where you can access different attributes in the data and then already start from a, from a, nice, from a nice viewpoint. So in the, in the case of, of Umetsat, you might look at the Meteosat data. Um, of course, you, you need to overcome a certain this, this list-based interface where you first have to have some idea of what you're actually interested in. If you're interested in, in sunshine uh, data, for example, how many hours of sunshine do we have? Uh, you have to know that radiation is the, is the topic, but I heard they're working on that to, to make it more, um, uh, explain it in a more, well, um, send them with their mouse style. Uh, you know, what, what is the data you're actually looking at here? So we, we chose, for example, the radiation data since we were for our use case, um, interested in sunshine. Yeah. How much sunshine did certain areas or regions in, in Germany or Europe receive and use that further on for the use case? Of course, you, yeah, you, can, you, you can then select, for example, the date that you're interested in, uh, the granularity. Do I want the last 10 years of data or do I just want a certain day And then what these, these, this data looks like, um, I'm, I know I'm talking to people who, who are also capable of understanding and, and working with lots um, more complex data, but you might just have, I mean, this Meteosat data, for example, is really just an XY uh, table uh, with, um, with a, a value <coughs> for each of the pixels. So these pixels correspond to latitude, longitude on a map. And you end up with something like this. So this is really the last uh, 20 years um, of data for Germany, and here we have the, the average yearly sum of sunshine. So it's it's quite interesting here down here where we are now. It's actually a very good spot for for installing solar panels on your house, while up there it's getting less and less interesting, yeah. but still profitable. But the break even is extended. Okay, so we already saw that once we have the data, we want to have some visuals. We want to see something, and then this is, this is much more accessible, of course, as the data table than the data table. So, but it doesn't matter what, what you do. There are all kinds of, of tools out there these days that help you with this step, coming from the data table to a visuals. So whether you whether you, often in the, in the tools you have a, like a button that you can click and say, okay, I have this data, show me what, how you would show it, you know, how the system can come up with some kind of idea, visually. Whether it's uh, points, lines, areas, volumes, and if you use colors or different, different forms or um, lines to, to show the data, doesn't really matter. I mean, um, it matters, of course, how you visualize it. Um, we cannot go into detail, of course, now for which data type you should use, which visualization. There's, uh, if you're interested, there's lots more of material where there are, there are certain, yeah, some rules of thumb that they, they can use, which visualization is good for which data. But, um, for example, here, uh, color is, is also a huge topic. Um, when you use the the Panoply data viewer that Umetsat offers, you can you can download the data and already visualize some of their data in a really accessible form. And they use certain color scales, as we say, that make sense or that were proved to be helpful for people to understand what is in the data. So here we have this long wave radiation flux, which more or less corresponds to the the amount of sunshine that a certain area gets, and the and you can see that, well, yeah, at the equator there's more sunshine than in Europe, which you probably guessed, but here you have the, the, quanti the quantities, and you can really see what's it like. And you can use this data to, to calculate things.
Okay, so the, the last step when I, when I have this visualization, maybe you have more than one visualization or you have some, want to have some, some ways to interact with the, with the data, and that really happens when I, when I use views, when I put all these visualizations, the different visualizations into an interactive component, and then the user can start to do things with the data. And that's very the, the step where I want to get to. Um, of course, also, this step is, is very much supported by many of today's tools, where you can have dashboards and, and combine different visualizations that are linked by brushing and linking, as we say, so using the same color as we have it in this example here, or here, as you see it in a larger view. Um, and the idea is that the user, of course, can then start to interact, click on certain things, and find out more about the data. The interaction is really the main thing when you when you don't really know what the user is looking for, right? So all the exploration, all the exploratory cases of data analytics, we actually almost definitely need visualizations. And so without the user, what what do we? How how can we show the right thing? Right? So interaction is, is important. And interaction is the interaction of the user can happen with all, all the steps from raw data down to visualization. So whether we use the right data, we want to take in more data, or whether the visualization is probably not the right one, I want to try out other visualizations, or, well, I want to combine the visualizations in a different way, and I want to interact then with the view while I'm analyzing the data. So that's interactive visualization. Of course, as, I, as the title says, we're talking about visual analytics cases, and visual analytics is probably one step further from simple data visualization. So you don't have, I mean, this, this pile of, of paper here, you could think, well, yeah, if I have a weekend, I can probably go through these, go through these documents and find out what's in there. Or maybe I can digitize these, these uh, documents uh, in a weekend and find out what's happening there. Um, if I have big data, we say today, um, even though some, some people don't like this word, and big data was around for the last 20 years, we just didn't call it big data, um, and it's going to be there in the next 20 years, even though we stopped calling it big data. But let's say we have lots of data, and certainly you can find lots of data in open data sources like UMITSA. Then we have the problem um, that, that is approached by visual analytics, that we simply have too much data. We cannot all visualize it, or it's so aggregated that we don't see anything anymore. But there are disciplines around for many, many years that dealt with these problems, and that's automated data analysis, data analytics, data mining, models, knowledge discovery. And that's one way, one automated way to get knowledge out of data by building a nice model that understands the data, does something to the data, that can simulate certain things. I mean, models come in all kinds of flavors. You might have a weather model or a, uh, an atom model or a model about the solar system. Um, all these things are models. I mean, if you want to find out, you can find out with the data, with the model, for example, when is the next eclipse. Or you can find out, well, do, will we have sunshine tomorrow? Also here in Heidelberg, probably not. Mm. It's supposed to rain. <laughs> um, but we wouldn't know that without a model. Okay. <clears throat> so visual analytics, and here visualization comes back into play. Visualization is really a combi visual analytics is a combination of this model-based approach with a visual approach. So visualizing data works really nice if you don't have that much data, if you don't have too much data. What's the, what's the problem with the model down there? Well, you might have something like a black box model. And some people don't like that for all the different applications. Black box means there's some model that does something, but you don't really know what. And then there's some results that you visualize, and then you have to believe it or not. For example, financial market models prove to be quite wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
everyone uh, believed in those models, and then the big crash came, and we had a problem. So it would be nice to have more of a white box, or a glass box, as some people say, where you can really see what, what happens to the model. Of course, you need to go more towards data science. Uh, you have to have an understanding of these models. You, you don't want a CEO, for example, to, to use a white box uh, approach. They are happier with the black box approach, but some people in the company should know what, <laughs> what's happening inside the model. So, OK. That much towards uh, about uh, visual analytics. So we thought when we, when we were visiting UMATSAT and talked also about their open data sources, we, we came up with an idea also about a use case that we, that we might really show, that, that might show what can we do with the data that might benefit different, different people. For example, just the, the general citizen who wants to know, does it make sense to install a solar panel on my roof? So let's take this user use case here. So we, we have all this data from UMEDSAT about how much sunshine there was in the last 20 years and, and longer. And um, of course, we can do predictions about um, the, solar, the solar radiation for the next year, next five years for the region that I live in. So if, I, if I'm here from, from Heidelberg or from Darmstadt, there's already quite some different numbers here. Um, even in the, that's more like a, a small fraction. It is between 1,100 and 1,200 kilowatt hours per square meter. Okay. So it makes a difference where you are. The temperature plays a role since solar panels work better if the temperature is quite low. In the, in the big heat of summer, they don't produce that much um, power. Maybe you, I didn't know that uh, until I talked to people in this area. Then you want to know what's your roof pitch and what's your roof orientation. And then if you take all these things in, you, of course, you end up with a really complex mathematical formula that you really want, need to understand. You're back in the white box, black box problem. <coughs> Thankfully, um, though, there are some people around that are, well, trustable who actually built this mathematical formula. I mean, if I'm, if I'm a general citizen, I want to find out uh, if I asked the vendor of a solar panel whether it makes sense to install a solar panel, then he would say, of course it makes sense. And uh, he wants to sell the solar panel. Of course it makes sense for him. Um, but um, if I really want to have this, well, a bit more objectively, I might, for example, if I live in Berlin, I could then go to one of these sites here. You can see the, the web address down there. You can just punch in your, your, your street address and get a nice 3D picture of what the different roofs look like that you, that you have in your area. And here you can see, okay, the red roofs don't work that well or the yellow roofs are, are okay. Um, whether, who, whether Solaris is also selling solar panels, um, we have to find out. But um, you can you can at least find out what the what the um, what the megawatt per hour per year can can be. So we use UMET, you can use UMETSAT data to find out. There's also maybe other people who might be interested in in UMETSAT data and find out about solar panels. And this, this are, these are businesses and. Um, for example, uh, colleagues of us in, in Stuttgart did a, a project for the Altes Postamt in, in Munich, which is the old post office building in Munich, and where they really used the UMETSAT data um, and level of detail two data of, of this building to find out for each surface on the building how much what per square meter can I get out of this roof. So it really depends on the, on the roof pitch and the, and the orientation, but they have a detailed model then, even with, with the self-shadowing of different buildings, uh, building parts, um, you can come up with a really exact number by using the data really directly from UMETSAT. You might, or we, we might also take this one step further in our use case and look at entire networks. So that's a project that we did for, for 
a larger energy provider here in Baden-Württemberg that, that probably narrows it down to one. Um, but <laughs> so th this region here um, is, is just part of their network, obviously, and it's anonymized so that they don't, you don't know which, 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 which town it is. And it's like the, 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 the distribution network the energy distribution network. So it's not, it's, it's several households or even several villages at one of these uh, nodes here each. So this energy provider wanted to know, they have a problem, as you might know. Renewable energy is, is creating problems in today's energy networks. So the network was built for <coughs> power to be distributed to households. It wasn't built for households producing energy and sending it back towards the, the power plant. So if there's a lot of sunshine, it's not too warm outside, maybe a day like today and some wind, that's like the worst case for, for the current situation, even though they can still handle it, but it, it creates problems. And they wanted to know where do I have the most problems? Where do we have the most sunshine, solar panel, wind energy plants uh, combination that we really have to look at more closely. And we did that for them, and, and you can zoom in interactively, which is easier here as a slide set, but you can inter interactively zoom in and see for each of these nodes then a calendar. A calendar which shows the distribution of data across the entire year. And we really have a visual analytics case here, since what we did first was we did a clustering of all the different um, daily patterns of their data to see, okay, what are the 16 groups of, of daily patterns of energy consumption that we have in your entire network. So there's the group where they have problems with, or here this, this part of, of this table, where the consumption is actually lower than the production of energy. That's the, those are the problematic cases. And then you have the normal cases where people just use a lot of power, which is great for the for the energy provider. So in winter, they are fine. In winter, they have these high consumption areas. But then in, in summer, it's also fine. But exactly as I said, in, in, in the spring and in October, September, they have problems. Since suddenly, um, well, the solar panels are at the peak of their, of their um, efficiency. And then the households don't consume enough power. And then what we did for them is, is to have, like also to look ahead for the entire network and find out wh where in my network do I, f do I need to make investments to, uh, to um, upgrade my, my network distribution. So again, we use Humidsat data, not only the solar radiation in this case, but also the wind data to, um, to simulate and predict how much energy is provided to the network from the household side. That's a visual analytics approach and we can, we can I guess we can go into more detail also today and I heard about the hackathon in June where you really can use satellite and, and climate data to get into this data that I just talked about in more detail. Maybe as a, as a, as a takeaway message from the visualization side, um, there are three points maybe that I wanted to mention. One is data analytics is fine, but we have to utilize the human vision more to accelerate the understanding of data. And this channel that uh, between screen and brain is underutilized at the moment. So we see a lot of we see a lot of line charts, we see a lot of pie charts that are really, really there's a lot of space being wasted for only five numbers. And we can condense that much more. And um, what I showed you with the with the calendar is, is a way of condensing a lot of information in one little calendar. The other thing is there are many tools that can help you well, access open data sources. Um, it's not like you have to do everything uh, manually. There are many sources also to get from humans data over their tools to, to find out what, what, 
what is in the data to get a first glimpse at is that the, the data that I'm looking for, and then combine it into tools um, to have a nice view on this open data to, under, to, to get further along with your exploratory task, right? So it's about also about users and tasks. And combine models with visualization for open big data or big open data or just data. Um, and this is also facilitated by tools, for example, like SAS Visual Analytics, where you have different tools, but not uh, from Fraunhofer, so there are also other tools, of course, but um, being here in Heidelberg today, of course, you can use their tools, for example, to get to combine models with visualization. And it's getting easier and easier to understand the models, and it's getting easier and easier to, to find the right visualization for your data. Combining all that, I think we can get to <coughs> data and analytics and insights much, much quicker. And visualization is, I think, the best way to do this. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And thank you very much.